Europeans have writing, they have gunpowder, they have urban centers, they have literacy, they have number systems. The idea uh, that in the old Western sieve, <laughs> gold, God, and glory, the idea in the old Western sieve textbooks uh, before you were born, before I was born, was that democracy started in ancient Greece, it was emulated by the Romans, and it spreads west to the New World, and Europe brings democracy to the New World. Now that kind of uh, argument is, is basically gone, but we still get in most Western Civ textbooks a basically a story about technology in the West. Um, yes, they're connected to the uh, Islamic world. Disease is an important one. I want to suggest that the story of con colonization is more interesting and weird than the story of just uh, God's guns and glory, more um, interesting and weird than just imperialism or uh, trading posts or uh, guns. So to start with, uh, this is probably oops, familiar to you. About 180 to 200 million years ago, um, the land masses on the on the planet are separated. So we, first we have Pangaea, which is one big land mass, and then those land masses are separated. They're never entirely separated. The Americas from from uh, Europe, there is this sort of um, uh, uh, land bridge, uh, mostly covered by ice, and that land bridge in uh, about. Um, uh, the land bridge in about fourteen thousand years ago is available for crossing. And across this land bridge, um, there's divergence. Most animals found it difficult to make the journey from uh, Eurasia to uh, the uh, Americas. And um, they, they had their genetic changes are required. It took hundreds of thousands of years for animals uh, to, to tra cross over. The last important evolutionary change that we humans had was about 40,000 years ago when Homo sapiens appeared. So what, what are homo sapiens? You know this, uh, it's our bigness of our brains, our ability to store and alter patterns of behavior. It made us specialists in adaptability and made it easier for us to move longer distances. Um, so what does that mean? It basically means that genetically, um, there aren't really important genetic differences between um, the, the native people in the Americas and people in, in, uh, in Europe and Asia, that genetically we're all kind of homo sapiens. Um, there, um, about 14,000 years ago, there was a land bridge between Alaska and Northeast Asia, the Bering Straits, Straits, and there were probably movements before that along the coast with animal skin boats. Okay, so there's the Bering Land Bridge, uh, kind of seen from uh, us, and about 14,700 years ago, uh, humans crossed from uh, sort of Asia into Europe, um, and before that, there had been no uh, uh, humans in the in the uh, the North Americas. And then, about twelve thousand six hundred years ago, there was actually uh, a, probably a very clear corridor with no ice uh, that people could pass through. So, about fifteen thousand years ago, people passed by boats and other animals crossed this uh, land bridge. And then, about twelve thousand years ago, they did. Okay. Uh, tons of animals also apparently thrived in this corridor that about 12,000 years ago, uh, deer, mastodons, etc. Um, the timing suggests that the 14,000 uh, year ago migration took place without a land bridge. Okay, so some peculiar features. Native Americans were separated from the rest of the world then for over 10,000 years. But there's no difference in intelligence, no difference in evolution between the, those people and or pe people who are Native Americans and, pe and people who are not Native Americans. Um, but the separation of the landform with a relatively short east-west axis leads to important differences in food cultivation and thus many other factors we often see. <laughs> yes. Uh, sorry about the... the I'm going to try, try to... I'm, I'm, I, I'll try to talk slowly. Um, I, I don't know if that's going to help with the buffering. All right. So look at Eurasia here. With a relatively short, uh, long east-west axis... Uh, there are important differences in food cultivation that allow food to travel quickly. So when, when food is discovered in one area in Eurasia, it can quickly, because it's on the same latitude, travel back and forth along there. So look at this. We've got here um, emmer wheat that's developed in the Near East. It's first about 10,000 years ago. 
uh, you'll notice that it's that all of these foods that are discovered and then cultivated happen after the land bridge and after the after the separation between the Americas and um, the the sharp separation between the Americas and Europe. So we've got emmer wheat that develops around 10,000 years before the present, about 8,000 uh, BC, and it travels very quickly all across Europe. Now, if you look at where food is developed, Europe develops no food at all. It doesn't cultivate or initially cultivate any of this food. It just borrows from other places. BP means before the present. Um, it's confusing. I don't know why people don't use the BC numbers because before the present, it's always changing every year. Uh, but BP, so 5,000 BP would be about 3,000 BC. Does that make sense? Right? Before before the Christian era, before Christ, uh, Christ before we, you know, the, um, uh, those dates. So um, we also see rice and rice and wheat are the two major, uh, right, BCE is before the common era, BC is uh, before Christ. Uh, those, those are the dates that we use. BP is an, another date that kind of anthropologists often use. So about 8,000 years ago, rice is developed, about 10,000 years ago, wheat is developed. If you look at the Americas, there are a whole bunch of things that are domesticated that are very important. But what's important about them is that they don't move very well. Right. So, for example, the potato is developed here in uh, out of nightshade in uh, this area that's that's basically Peru. And it doesn't move that far because it doesn't have a long lateral east west axis. Uh, it could potentially move here, but potatoes are grown mostly up in the mountains and it doesn't move here. Wheat, on the other hand, has a long lateral space that it can move across. And so once wheat is developed here, People from Spain all the way to China are, are harvesting wheat uh, within a few hundred years. Okay. The short east-west axis in the Americas means so important differences in food uh, cultivation. Um, what happens in this space over the 12,000 years ago is multiple food domestication events. And that's millet here in pulses in India, uh, wheat here. Uh, in the Americas, in, in, there's African rice, which is a kind of brown rice, pearl millet in Africa, uh, white rice up here in um, kind of central China, and it moves uh, down. Given the way domesticated plants stay in narrow uh, latitude bands, it means that there's a broad swath of land where wheat, for example, is cultivated and quickly adopted by others. Yeah, food can't travel north or south because of climate differences, but because basically if you try to take corn, for example, that's developed here, that's maize here in, in Southern America, and you try to bring it just a few degrees north latitude, it'll die. Okay, it won't last. You can try to train it. You can find some stuff that, that allows it to last a little bit longer, but it will take you hundreds of years. It took these people hundreds of years for this to move. So maize has developed 9,000 uh, years before the present, it doesn't arrive up here until about uh, 100 or 200 AD. So it takes something like 7,000 years for corn to travel just 30 degrees north in terms of latitude because it, the seasons are different uh, because the temperature is different. And uh, so it's very different, different. Does that make sense? So it can't travel easily uh, north and south. It can travel very relatively easily east and west. Awesome. Okay. Uh, so it's first called maize, what, what we call corn, is first cultivated in the Aztec area in Mexico. It, it doesn't get to Georgia and Virginia and New England until around 100 AD, so about 7,000 years. It has to slowly be evolved to suit the cooler climate of North America. Okay, that's a big problem for the Americas. That means that food domestication is really complicated and um, there's not a strong enough east-west access for it easily to be developed. There are certain things like marsh elder and shinopod, which are no longer cultivated, but were used as food before, which could have gone east and west, but for reasons we don't quite understand, they, they don't. Okay, this east-west food access is not just true for animals, for, for food, it's also true for domesticated animals. The dog is first domesticated about 20,000 years ago, uh, and it quickly spreads across Europe. Uh, the pig, the goat, and the cow all kind of co-evolve with humans, uh, and this is in Eurasia, right? 
uh, and are selectively breeded so that their evolution goes in a direction that humans want. So you kill the wolf pups that growl at you and keep the, keep the ones that beg for food. And, um, and then basically over time, humans can domesticate these animals and make use of them. So first is the auroch. This is, this is around 10,000 years before the present. The auroch is developed and this becomes the ox, the horse, the zebu, and the water buffalo. Uh, they're domesticated separately in different parts of the world. So the water buffalo in China, uh, the zebu in India, the ox in, uh, sorry, the, not the horse, the ox in, um, uh, in, and the cow in Europe about 10,000 years ago. These radically improved the mobility of humans, uh, providing them with power. So oxen can pull horses and oxen can go pull plows. The house comes, the horse comes much later. Uh, as you can see here, about 5,500 years before the present. And um, it radically improves the mobility of humans providing power. The ox and the horse, the auroch rather, and the horse um, can eat uh, many of the foods that humans can eat or some of the foods that humans can eat and cultivate. And they radically improve the mobility of humans providing them with power. The horse comes much later and is quickly adopted uh, across these vast Eastern and Western plains. This isn't just people sharing stuff. Often the new domesticated animals and plants facilitate invasion and conquest, uh, like the Neolithic expansion from 10,000 BC to 4,700 BC. So Europe doesn't, uh, the, the Americas don't get the same kind of Neolithic expansion that, that um, the sort of expansion of tools that, that spread. And this is again, uh, we're now in BCE, uh, 10,000 BC to about 6,000 BC, we see um, with the development of the auroch and the cow and the ox, uh, this movement of people, a fairly quick movement of people across this European landmass. This, we don't know because we don't have any written records about whether this was an invasion or whether it was just a movement and trade of goods. Probably it was both. There was a movement of trade of goods, but probably genetically there was a movement of people who kind of invaded from the east to the west in this region. But although we can't say for certain um, uh, precisely what's happening, but these animals are moving. With the horse, um, sorry, uh, I won't talk about the horse yet, just yet. So one of the things that happens in Eurasia is what's called the milk revolution. And that is uh, humans get minor evolutionary changes as civilizations expand. And basically as humans, human communities expand and contract, they mostly contract because of massive famines that happen again and again over the previous centuries. The milk revolution is, um, because the biggest problem in the ancient world is famine, uh, cows are domesticated about 10,000 years ago, but around 5,000 BC, some kid in this area, bu, 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 where are we? In this area, um, develops a, a, a weird genetic disorder that allows him to drink animal milk after he's a baby. This genetic disorder um, is different from most humans. So most humans previously, if they drank um, either their mother's milk or an animal milk after age two, they couldn't really digest it. And this was an important evolutionary change that had been in most mammals uh, for, for centuries um, that, that basically ensured that, um, that mothers could have more children, right? After age two, you can no longer drink your mother's milk. You can no longer drink cow's milk. Um, but in, in this kid, um, we, we, this, this kid, he develops this, uh, a capacity to basically drink human milk. This resistance to milk um, uh, goes away for this kid. Presumably after a famine, this child and his descendants are able to survive by drinking animal milk when everyone else is suffering famine. A mother is gone, and so the cow becomes a kind of replacement for dead mothers, right? So for this person and his or her descendants, uh, those people can drink cow's milk when everyone else is facing a famine. Uh, this lactose tolerance, for those of you that have European uh, uh, ancestor, comes from this genetic tick. So many Europeans are descended from folks who have this uh, genetic capacity to, do, to drink milk. Does that make sense? It is sad, right? It's terribly sad. Um, 
But this is this is what happens. And so uh, the people who survive this famine in this European area, what becomes a European area, are the ones who can drink milk. And so this is part of why you see a pretty sharp distinction in Asia and uh, the U.S. between people who can drink milk and people who can't. So uh, for for many Americans, drinking milk for breakfast, you know, breakfast cereal and stuff like that is common. Uh, for many people of, of Asian descent, it's actually much more difficult to drink milk. Um, one kind of offensive Japanese word for um, Europeans is milk drinkers, uh, because uh, and so this goes back to this uh, this this co-evolutionary development among Europeans that they they're able to. Um, digest milk and survive through um, uh, famines. Okay, so that's an important difference. Yeah, if you have European and Asian ancestry, you could you could tell. <laughs> Let me tell you, as somebody um, who's uh, you know got a, a very mixed ancestry, I can say that uh, um, your ability to develop to, to digest milk is is will depend on which you get from. Now that said, it's a little more complicated. It's not that it's impossible for people who are from Asian of Asian descent to drink uh, milk. Uh, but they don't get as many nutrients necessarily from it. They're also the gut flora that can potentially digest the lactose and turn it into um, sugar so that you can you can digest it. So it's not it's not as if you can't drink it at all, but there are more nutrients that come from milk uh, for those who have this uh, European ancestry. Uh, yeah, and some others with European ancestry don't have it. Uh, actually, further north, if you have Swedish ancestry, um, you can digest uh, reindeer milk, but not uh, milk from cattle. Okay. So there are other technologies that come from wheat that are, uh, that take a little, come from wheat and animals uh, that are, we don't really think of as technologies, but one of them is, is what's called the three field agriculture. So with domestication of food and animals, there are technologies that allow uh, much more access, much more, many more people to live per acre on land than previously. The free field lo uh, rotation is basically where you um, plant wheat one season and then allow it to grow fallow the next season and then grow barley and lentils uh, the third season, or another season, the barley and oats and lentils together um, rejuvenate the soil and allow you to grow wheat the next the next year. So previously, uh, say sort of before uh, 1000 AD, um, there were constant famines. After around 1000 AD, in Europe anywhere ways, there's this rotation of of crops that allow you to have more people per square mile than previously without having a famine. Um, they they didn't they sort of figured it out. Uh, it's not clear who came up with it. We'll never know who came up with this three-field rotation. We now know, it wasn't until really the 20th century that we knew that what um, oats and lentils did in particular was rejuvenate the soil by putting uh, putting stuff back into the soil. And it wasn't the oats and lentils themselves. It was the bacteria that developed around lentils uh, and oats when they're planted that uh, effectively rejuvenated the soil. It basically trial and error, exactly. So that's a technology too that allows much more dense settlement in Europe and Asia as rotation of crops. That's a technology too. And so we should, wouldn't just think about guns, but we should also think about things like an ability to make use of the land in a way that allows more people to live on it. Okay. Now, remember I said that the, with the development of the horse, uh, it's not just, you know, a kumbaya moment where uh, somebody says, oh, look, we have a horse. Isn't this awesome? We can uh, we can now move ourselves um, from place to place. Uh, there are cases in which um, access to horses and the use of horses um, allows uh, widespread um, uh, invasion. And, the, and the, 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 the most well known of this is, of course, uh, what's called the Mongolian invasion uh, across uh, in, from Mongolia around Karakum into China and into Europe. Um, one of the things that very recently we've we've um, or, or has very recently been discovered by uh, historians and geneticists is that um, with the, the Mongolian migrations east and west, uh, there also came uh, Yersinia pestis, which is which is basically plague, and plague may have undermined these communities, making ad advances more possible. So. The, the tech, what is the technology that the Mongols have? They have an ability, they have small horses. 
They have an ability to fight on horseback with uh, fantastic uh, bows and arrows. Um, and they have an ability to bring with them uh, dried food, particularly millet, uh, that allows them to have sustained campaigns and invade others. So invasion is also probably in the picture when we're talking about Eastern and Western migration. It's not just like uh, necessarily that people pass on these wheat, uh, wheat and these other technologies. It's also possible that invasion uh, makes it possible for others to um, uh, make use of them. Diseases also travel this way, also often pass back and forth between humans and domesticated animals. Uh, an example is, is the plague, which first lives inside fleas on marmots, and then the flea crosses over to rats, and the rats live around humans. The, um, the, the plague then uh, infects humans and kills, uh, wipes out basically massive numbers of populations. Uh, roughly a third of everyone in Eurasia died in around 5000 BC because of the plague. Roughly a third of, uh, well, a, an, an eighth to a third of the human populations died in 541 AD, when it was what was called the Plague of Justinian. Uh, roughly a third of Europeans died in 1349 when the plague came again uh, to Europe. So there are massive, this East-West thing is not just great for technologies um, and, and for uh, development of food, it's also great for the spread of diseases which um, pass back and forth in these in these regions. Does that make sense? So um, growing, once somebody learns to grow wheat around here, around Trebizond, it can go back and forth, uh, east and west over a relatively long period. Technologies that are connected with wheat, like three field agriculture or the plow or horses, uh, all those things that make you um, kind of more capable of producing more food and surviving, all those things travel quickly back and forth. Invasions also are, are made more easy in this, um, in this process of a long, long, very long five, this is what, uh, this is about 6,000 miles from Hungary to Lake Bakal here. And this 6,000 mile passage means that uh, basically once something is developed in one part of this world in the same latitude, it travels very quickly uh, back and forth across them. People in the Americas don't get these animals that allow mobility. Uh, the exception is the llamas in um, the Andes Mountains, but the Americas don't have animals, it turns out, that are, can be domesticated in the same way or have, have large animals, uh, pack animals or delivery animals that can um, travel long distances. The llama is the one exception. The Incas, the Incas did domesticate things. They domesticated um, uh, hamsters, uh, which were both pets and food. Uh, the, the, there are other animals that are, the turkey is domesticated and things like that. But uh, you couldn't domesticate uh, four-legged animals in the Americas. And this really limits people's ability to move east and west or uh, move around in the Americas. So there are a couple of urban areas in chapter one. One is the Anasazi, the other is the Hokokum, the Mississippian communities. Each of these communities has urban areas of about, um, you know, tens of thousands of people in them, but they don't last uh, terribly long. They last about three or 400 years. They're gone by the time the Europeans come to the Americas, okay? So it's not like the Americas don't have urban regions. Um, the Incas, the Mayas, the Aztecs also had urban regions, but we don't have this kind of Mongolian, invasion scenario where people can travel extremely long distances uh, very quickly. There is trade in the Americas. So you've got corn and shells that come from what's what we would call the uh, upper Midwest here. We've got marine shells that come from the West. Some of these things are traded, but uh, travel takes much, much longer in the Americas because basically no horses, no aurochs, uh, no cows. There are bison, but they can't be domesticated. Uh, we don't really know why that is. Uh, there's a story among geneticists about why domestication happens um, that suggests that when we domesticate an animal, we basically lock it into its, uh, what's the word? Uh, we lock it into a kind of childlike state. Um, and um, we, we, we identify those animals that have low levels of cortisol. Cortisol is the thing that makes you, give, gives you, the, makes you anxious and gives you the fight or flight phenomenon. And so um, most wild, many wild animals um, aren't very good around humans because if they get spooked, uh, they can tear an animal to bits. This is why nobody's been able to domesticate um, 
you know, um, cougars or wildcats or anything like that is because they, they all have really high levels of cortisol. Uh, but dogs and cats um, can be domesticated. Uh, bison, though, which are in the American Midwest, cannot be domesticated. Um, they don't act well as pack uh, pack animals are cassowaries. <laughs> I have no idea what a cassowary is. Uh, okay, so the ultimate fact that factors that distinguish Europe, uh, Eurasia from the Americas is this vast east-west axis of about 6,500 miles um, and relatively easy movement back and forth along this east-west axis um, facilitated by rivers and streams. And so you can pass, uh, there, there is a, a land that's here, but you can pass from the Red Sea all the way around to China. Um, you can pass, uh, let's see here, from the Black Sea through Constantinople to the Mediterranean. You can pass around Europe. The Americas don't have that same kind of, there are rivers, but it's it's uh, quite a bit harder to travel, for example, from one, the, the, um, the Americas in the north to the Americas in the south. People can travel relatively short distances. Um, people, because of, cow, of, of aurochs, because of cattle, because of oxen, because of horses, are able to travel much longer distances. Uh, the other thing that Europeans have is food surplus and storage that connected with the development of wheat, uh, which is easy to store, relatively easy to store. It's possible to travel also long distances. Uh, the potato does not store very well. Uh, corn does not store very well. And so as a result, it's harder, It's although it's possible, to, to develop uh, urban regions. So what we get in the Europe, in the sort of Eurasia is large, dense, sedentary, stratified societies um, that get technologies like guns, like steel, like swords. Okay, bear with me here for a second. So technologies that grow out of humans domesticating food and animals have follow-on effects. For example, the stirrup for horses, right? A stirrup, which is developed sometime in the Middle Ages, uh, allows people to travel on horses and fight on horses. Uh, stirrups become a kind of key advantage uh, that allow um, kind of mobile uh, horse-based uh, societies to kind of dominate uh, uh, more sedentary societies. Stirrups lead to the development of steel, which are then, um, can, can then be used for things like swords and, and other sharper uh, objects. Weed is connected to crop rotation uh, technology that allows denser settlement of people. Um, there's intense competition along these east-west axis in uh, Europe that you don't quite see in uh, the Americas. More people per square mile means more opportunities to refine, twist, and appropriate technologies around domesticated food and animals. So for example, the Chinese develop printing, the Chinese develop uh, gunpowder, the Chinese develop water wheels, and those technologies are used by Europeans, reused, refitted by Europeans for long distance communication using printing uh, and weapons um, with uh, uh, and gunpowder is used for weapons. They're not developed, used by the Chinese for weapons. They're mostly used by the Chinese for you know, fireworks and things like that. Um, but the Europeans take this Chinese technology and uh, reforge it into weapons. So if we go back to domesticated plants, domestication starts many places, but not in Europe and Russia, as you see. So Europe has no domestication events. Russia has no domestication events. But foods developed elsewhere are easily moved along lines of latitude to other areas, and technologies are also moved along these lines. So why can Europe conquer? Because it appropriates animals and foods, domesticates them um, in a way that's harder to do in, Ameri in the Americas. There are domestication events in the Americas, but those um, foods don't move very easily or very quickly. That said, Two technologies that are going to drastically change Europe are, of course, already are in the Americas. One of them is corn, which is uh, listed here as maize. The other one is the potato, uh, listed here in, in the Inca. After settlement, corn and potato are going to radically reorganize European society. Okay, the potato is going to make it possible for even denser. Uh, population, set, settlement of populations in Europe. Uh, corn is going to make it possible uh, to kind of feed animals in a way that had previously been impossible. Okay, 
So that is why, that's the, the first answer to why Europe sort of has these advantages is, um, uh, and, I'm, and I'm borrowing here from the, a book called Guns, Germs, and Steel, is that this long latitude allows uh, the, the development of technologies that don't quite exist in the Americas. So the qu second question is why Portugal and Spain? Okay. And that's a question that I don't think anybody has answered well, but I'm going to give you my answer for it. Um, okay. Oh, so, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, to start with, what's happened to my images here? Sorry, I'm not trying to get, make you guys give you guys epilepsy, but I'm I've lost my. All right. Just let me say one a couple a couple more things about technology. Uh, one of them is this east-west trade goes all the way back long before written uh, history. So. So the trade between China and Europe goes back thousands of years before Europe, Europeans even knew about China, before Europeans had a word for China. There was trade of porcelain and silk from China uh, into uh, this, the sort of, uh, in this area in e uh, India, all the way up to Egypt and uh, to, um, uh, to, to the Latin world. There's, there's tremendous long distance trade. Okay, Islam. So East-West trade is dominated by um, Islam, sort of Islamic traders, since the time of Muhammad. They take over North Africa around the 7th century and the Iberian Peninsula by the 8th century. That is, um, this is, this is the Iberian Peninsula, basically Spain. Sicily in the 9th century. And um, Syrian Jews are the primary, are some of the traders. And what does Europe have to offer in terms of international trade? Europe has relatively little. Uh, it's basically timber and slaves. Um, remember that since the fall of the Roman Empire around six or seven hundred, um, the uh, is Islam is expanding. Europe is a backwater. And you have Teutonic chieftains that oversee tiny domains in this period. The center of civilization from the seventh to the 11th century is arguably uh, it, the, um, the people who are connected followers of a Muhammad, uh, sort of Islamic traders. There's trade over nearly half the world and it's dominated by these Arab traders. Ivory and uh, other goods from Africa, uh, cloth and bead from India, nutmeg and pepper from the Spice Islands, porcelain and silk from China, uh, Europe has relatively little. It has timber and slaves. And for, in fact, the word Slav, slave itself comes from Slav, uh, probably. And Slavs were the people who came from this area above the Black Sea uh, in what's now Ukraine. They were captured and brought down to um, uh, initially Constantinople and sold as slaves throughout uh, the Mediterranean region. Uh, so, so Europe has relatively little. Uh, and Europe is really the really behind the times. Why Portugal and Spain? Partly it's proximity to the New World. If we look at, um, uh, bear with me. Where's my map of Europe? Okay, <laughs> let's start with this one. Uh, you know, if we, if we look at Spain here, if we look at Portugal here, it kind of makes sense that they would be the first ones to travel to the New World. That said, you might expect Japan to move eastward and discover in America in that direction. Uh, the Americas. It's 4,700 miles from Japan to Vancouver, and there are islands in the middle. It's 4,100 miles from Portugal to the Caribbean. So it's a long distance over water, but it's not that far from Japan to uh, the Americas than it is from, from uh, the Caribbean to the Americas. One answer is the caravel. That's the, that's the answer you're going to get in this textbook. It's the caravel. Uh, that's what, um, the, the, this, this is a maneuverable ship that's developed by the Europeans, um, particularly in Portugal and Spain. And this ship, the Caravel, this is the Nina, the Penta, and the Santa Maria, the three ships that um, travel over with Christopher Columbus. These ships are super, this is a super technology that Portugal and Spain has that others don't. This is a clever idea, but it's actually not uh, true at all. Uh, the Caravel is actually a ripoff from China from a hundred years earlier. This is a replica of one of the treasure ships of Admiral Zheng He. This ship is five times the size of the Caravel. And um, 
China actually was much more likely to have uh, discovered the New World than Europeans. They had better ships. This ship is five times the size of a caravel, and it's just as maneuverable as a caravel. And in fact, the maneuverability with these uh, midden sails and upsails and things like that are lifted from Chinese technology and used in the caravel. This is the voyage of Zhang, Zhang He in, from the Han China from 1417 to uh, 1430. And as you can see, the Chinese are capable of traveling just about anywhere that they want to um, in, uh, right, they've been in China since 1371. Uh, so, so the Chinese have a much better technology, a much more uh, obviously centralized society. It seems more likely that the Chinese, in terms of technology, would have arrived here first. Um, so the possibility should have been that China would have discovered the new world. But for reasons we don't fully understand, China destroys its treasure fleet around 1430. It's possibly because of a continued threat of a land war with the Mongols, possibly because of the cost of this treasure fleet, which was expensive, and possibly a fear of an increasingly powerful merchant class in China. But for whatever, for whatever reason, China, which should have been the country, the, the region that to first to discover, <laughs> right, to mind its own business, um, to, to discover the new world, it doesn't, it doesn't do that. The second would be the Hanseatic League. If I was going to choose, if I'm looking at the world in 1400 uh, to 1500, if you were looking at the world, looking for the most powerful region, number one would be China. Right, it has much to gain, so much wealth, and and Western Europe has more to establish, uh, to gain from from exploration. Uh, it's not at war with Japan. It's really at war with them. Well, uh, that's a good question. I'm not I'm not sure if it's a war with Japan. It's certainly at war with the Mongols in this period, and it's it's sort of uh, it's got it's constantly kind of trying to beat back the Mongols up in. Um, uh, let me go back here to this Mongol. So China down here is, uh, is, faces the Mongol threat kind of uh, repeatedly again and again uh, in this period. Okay. This is the Hanseatic League. They established trading ports all along the North Sea and the Baltic. They established multi-story buildings for trade. They have men who um, at a very young age have to swear off having children, promise not to get married, they cut their hair short, and they live in trading communities around 1400 in all of these cities. This is the Hanseatic League from say 1200 to around 1400. Um, this Hanseatic League uh, has tremendous power in both the North Sea and the Baltic Sea. Uh, they're the biggest traders probably in the world, even more, uh, certainly more so than China, uh, certainly more so than India. This is, this is some of the areas that are nominally controlled by this Hanseatic League. The wealthiest city in the world in 1400 is probably Lubeck. They have amazing ships, but the issue is that they basically control all the trade in Northern and Central Europe, along with London. They, they control uh, most of the uh, international trade to, to London. They have a sweet monopoly, and like China, not much reason to advance. Not much reason to move into regions, explore regions uh, that, are else, that are elsewhere. But for Spain and Portugal, the issue is, how does Spain and Portugal and the rest of Europe get to the spices? How do they get to uh, the porcelain? How do they get to the silk that comes from the East? It's controlled, it's dominated by Islam from around 700 forward. It's really European war, continual war with the Crusades and after with Islam that lead Europeans to eventually try to head west. Uh, if you look here, this, these, uh, this is uh, what's going to be, um, the, the straits between North Africa and Spain are controlled. This means that Europeans cannot actually connect from Northern Europe to Southern Europe without going through these straits, which are controlled by uh, Muslim traders. The second threat that follows after the spread of Islam from 700 to 1100 is the Ottoman Turks. And the Ottoman Turks in 1453 capture Constantinople, which is another sharp control point between Eastern and Western trade. Constantinople, which is gonna be called Istanbul afterwards, after the Turks take it over, Constantinople is where the trade between the Mediterranean takes place with the Black Sea, 
but also where a whole lot of the trade with the Mediterranean takes place with Asia over what's called the Silk Road up here through Georgia. Um, and so this trade also is controlled by the Turks, the Ottoman Turks, who are Islamic uh, after 1453. This is the uh, the Ottoman Empire at its at its largest expanse at around 1500, and they control then um, areas that have previously been Umayyad and Abbasid and other kind of Islamic uh, uh, um, empires. The Ottoman Empire sort of takes them over, takes many parts of them over, and so they control this massive region that's basically the center of the world as far as Europeans. Uh, pe uh, people in Asia, people in India, uh, people in Russia are concerned. This is the center of the world because this is the center of trade between the East and the West. And this trade has gone back, goes back 6,000 years, right? And uh, the Ottomans control it. Uh, this is another image of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and this is the reason. So once the Ottomans take control of Istanbul in 1453, it's even more important that Europeans get some way to get access to these other goods because the monopoly prices that the Ottomans are charging for these goods are very, very high for things like silk, for things like spices. And spices aren't just, oh, I'd really like to have some curry or I'd really like to have some pepper. Spices are all about preserving food and keeping away from famine. If you can use um, pepper and these other goods uh, on uh, uh, food, it's, it's, it controls it. Yeah, and Istanbul is the walled city. Um, this is Istanbul. This is um, the Hagia Sophia, and uh, which which had been uh, once it went when it was Constantinople, the um, the kind of center of the, the Christian world, take, taken over by uh, the Turks in 1453. This passageway between Europe and Asia here, you see Istanbul. That passage between Europe and Asia is one mile across. Okay, and that one mile is controlled by the walled city. Oh, is that <laughs> Sophia is named after Asha Sophia? Awesome! I actually visited here uh, recently. Um, you can actually now take a subway in Istanbul to go from Europe to Asia. Uh, you can get on one on a subway car in uh, Istanbul and cross over into Asia in basically one stop. It's kind of amazing. Uh, but this is one mile across, and this means uh, this is this is a pinch point that's. Um, uh, that's that's crucial. Okay, so Spain, for 500 years, tries to break this monopoly that uh, that uh, uh, Muslims have in this international trade. Yeah, it's a beautiful, it's a, an amazing city. Uh, all these stray cats and uh, stuff like that. Everybody feeds the cats, but nobody owns the cats. Uh, it's it's an astonishing place. Um, so this is Spain, and Spain is gradually, this is kind of Christian Spain, and, and the Christians in Spain, the Catholics in Spain, are, um, and, and this is the three three empires, this, uh, the, um, Castile and Aragon, uh, Leon Cast uh, Portugal, Leon Castile, and Aragon, these three Christian uh, empires retake Muslim Spain. Right? And they gradually start here and they gradually move south uh, over 500 years, trying to take control of trade between East and West from the Islamic world. And finally, in, oops, I've lost my, when is it? 1480 or so, 1460 or so, they take this, uh, this spot, which is uh, Gibraltar or uh, Jarab Altar, uh, Tariq, Jarab Tariq, uh, Jabral Tariq, Jabral Tariq, which is, which is basically the straits that separate Northern and Southern Europe. So Spain finally conquers this in 14, uh, 1460 or so. The Catholic part of Spain and Portugal spent 500 years, right? oh, and, and original Jabal Tariq, uh, is almost as important as Constantinople. They finally take it around 1460, and this allows Spain to, co to control trade between Northern Europe and Southern Europe through these straits. It's expanding externally against re um, Islam in what's called the Reconquista. Uh, 11, 10 to 12, 24. 11, 10 to 12, 15. When does this class end? Bear with me. Uh, 
1225. Okay. Am I right? 1110 to 1225? It is right. 1110 to 1225. Okay. I'm not, I'm not too far behind. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so Spain is expanding externally against Islam. And this is called the Reconquista. And this is the, I, I don't know, I forget what the, this, uh, but this is the Reconquista between 914, 942 and 1492. By 1490 or so, Spain is now in a position to at least control, um, be in a position to trade both north and south. It's enlarging its royal domain by drawing in more lords, um, increasingly in a kind of uh, story of invasion. That's why in 1491, For Europeans, 1491 is just as important. Oh, development, thank you. Uh, just as in, important as 1492. In fact, from the perspective of, say, uh, you know, 1500, uh, 1530, 1550, 1491 was more important than 1492. Why? Because 1491 is when Vasco da Gama is able to travel around the Cape of Good Hope and connect to Asia. Um, by going around Africa and basically getting around this Islamic um, control, which is also an Islamic uh, monopoly, right? And it's that, that monopoly power that Spain and Portugal desperately want to break. And they're going to go west to do it. They're, they're, they're not going to go west to do it. They're going to go anywhere else but west. West into the open ocean is crazy. Exactly. So um, the real trade, the really important trade that, uh, that Europeans want is, is trade with India and China. Uh, there's also trade with North Africa, but they do control uh, northern and southern Europe don't really um, uh, yeah, have access to, to world's trade. The people who are at the center, who people who benefit most from trade in the world, quote unquote, that is Eurasia, um, are, are uh, people, the sort of Islamic traders, and especially after 1453, the uh, Ottoman Turks. So 1491, sailing around South Africa was for Europe initially more important than 1492. Spain and Portugal's dream of bypassing Muslim traders and getting to the spices of the East, the spices that are used to preserve food. Okay, so the claim um, among historians in your Western Civ book you know, uh, uh, are that Europeans, quote, have a complex, well-developed, and above all, mobile technology of power, writing, navigational instruments, ships, war horses, attacked dogs, effective armor, and highly lethal weapons. Uh, that's all true. But why Spain and Portugal? When Spain and Portugal, in comparison to China, in comparison to the Hanseatic League, in comparison to the Ottoman Turks, are definitely 11th man on the totem pole, right? Spain and Portugal are, are nothing compared to these other massive and important empires. But Spain and Portugal desperately want to break this monopoly that um, the, the, the Turks have over trade between East and West. Okay. What they do once they sail around the Cape of Good Hope in, Africa, uh, in South Africa is to establish forts and trading posts along the coast of Africa here and here, uh, also uh, trading ports in India. They enter the Indian Ocean and the China Seas, and they spread uh, fur trade across the boreal forests. Um, uh, so, sorry, uh, will later sp spread a fur trade. The successful organizations were states with a high degree of concentration of command. And this is what's different about Spain and Portugal, is Spain and Portugal are, have a political class, a po kind of a political coalition between a centralizing executive, the king and the queen, and a merchant class. And that's different from uh, Islam. The, in, in Islam and the Ottoman Turks, the merchant class is not uh, the most important class. In China, the merchant class is not the most important class. Hanseatically, it, the merchant class is very important, but there's not a strong state. What Spain and Portugal have together is a kind of strong state, a strong centralizing executive with a great deal of money and a strong merchant uh, class that are, are also warriors, right? It's these merchant warriors that are the conquistadors. These merchant warriors who've been trained for five, whose families have been trained for 500 years to invade and control other regions. That 500 years of the Reconquista is a sort of training ground for what's gonna become the invasion of the Americas. 
Once the Americas are discovered in 1492, it's conquistadors from Spain and Portugal that are going to have this sort of both the wealth and the kind of military know-how to basically destroy their enemies. And this is why Spain and Portugal, I think, are most important. They are 11th man on the totem pole in terms of the empires of the world, but they have this sort of fairly strong centralizing executive connected with a merchant class. And that's something that's a little different about Spain and Portugal than the other major empires of the world. Okay, so two general answers for why Europe conquers the Americas. One is that long corridor for food innovation, including uh, guns and steel, um, technologies connected with food growing, domestication of animals that are connected with food growing. Uh, they try a lot, right? Uh, they um, they um, domesticated animals for mobility, human animal plagues that provide uh, resistances. Um, and many of the people have absorbed uh, smallpox, for example, and um, the children who survive smallpox and measles and all sorts of other diseases in Europe that have traveled likewise across these east-west corridors, uh, when they come, when they settle in the New World, when they come to the New World, they're going to bring those diseases with them, and those diseases are going to decimate um, uh, the rest of the world, um, uh, the Americas. A new kind of imperial power emerges around the 1300s that faces a subsistence crisis, a need to find material so that they can expand and destroy other P European powers and take the land of other Europeans. The weird result, though, is what they find is an area with few portable resources in this new world. When Columbus arrives, there's relatively little that he can take back over this long journey. What was gonna happen over the next, from 1492 for the next 100 years is a bunch of Western European states are gonna to try to find a way to dump um, underemployed and unemployed people into this land. They're eventually gonna capture and enslave Africans to bring them over to this land and try to get them to siphon off all the goods and send them back. Uh, this will actually fail pretty catastrophically, but it becomes the basis for a new kind of hybrid society in the Americas. The rest of this course will be studying that hybrid society that's created. We'll mostly be talking about what becomes the United States, but to do that, we need to keep understanding its broader borders, keep understanding how the U.S. fits into this larger world order and this larger world competition.